But anyway, hey everybody in Texas and Oregon, how's it going? Uh, welcome to the Connecting Communities Conference. We are excited for this run to talk about transportation. All right. We got to get. Okay, I'll go ahead and I'll start with the first question. So what we did is we each picked a question to ask each of the museums, and we're going to go around and uh, speak of each one as we go. So our question was, what type of unique transportation byways exist in your community, and is there a less used form of transportation that has persevered in your area? So I guess a little bit of background. My name is Rene Baestedos. I work at the Museum of South Texas History. We're located in Edinburgh, Texas, which is maybe 10 or 12 miles away from the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and we live in a little region called the Rio Grande Valley. It's four Texas counties uh, right at the southernmost tip of, of the whole state. And uh, there's a lot of cross-cultural um, connections with Mexico, as well as in our history. The development has really grown along with, uh, with that country. So one of the unique, cool, really cool things that we have down here is the Los Ebanos Ferry. Um, I'm wondering if anybody in our crowd has heard of that. Uh, it's the only existing ferry crossing that is licensed and handled by the government itself. It was established in 1950, but it's been used uh, for some time. Apparently the area on the river was an ancient ford, and even back to the colonial era, when the Spanish were coming in, uh, they were using that ford as a way to to move goods from side to side. Uh, the ferry also came into play during the Mexican-American War, and even in the 1920s during the Prohibition era, the ferry was even used to bring tequila over from Mexico when alcohol was uh, prohibited here in the United States. Um, so that's a place you can still go and visit. There is a state historic marker on site. It tells a little bit about the history there of the ferry. And it still exists. You can go down there and cross uh, the side. It's called Los Ebenos Ferry also because there's a number of uh, ebony trees which are native to the area. And those trees are all around the area right there where the ferry is, really making a nice backdrop. All right, and another really unique thing down here is we have a highway called Military Highway. The two highways that are kind of really used down here is the 83, that's an interstate, and also we have a business 83, which goes uh, right next to the railroad. But Military Highway was made when Zach Taylor was down here. Zachary Taylor eventually became the United States president. When he was down here during the Mexican-American War, um, they cut out a path that connected Brownsville to uh, the west side of our region, and it was right next to the river. Uh, so this was a place where troops could go up and down, uh, monitor the river, and still exists as a byway today. A lot less used than our big interstate, but it has a really pretty backdrop. You see a lot more of the open land. And, uh, and yeah, it's still a good way to get around. Uh, we have a number of state parks that are right next to that uh, highway as well. So that's another great thing that we have. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, sorry, Randy, you're having some uh, sound problems here. Okay, yeah, I thought I heard a little bit of echo. Yes, I'm hearing that right now. Uh, just a second. <laughs> okay, I think we're back to normal here. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to repeat the question for our audience that they didn't hear anything. Uh, it is what type of unique transportation byway exists in your community, and is there a less used use for? Uh, uh, here at Chittenango Landing, we have a very interesting transportation. The uh, Erie Canal in central New York, um, and we're a 19th century uh, dry dock, boat building complex near Syracuse. Um, for those of you. No. Um, anyway, so uh, we have a very uh, unique transportation history here in central New York. Um, we're on the Mohawk River Valley, which is the only point in the Appalachian Mountains between uh, Georgia and Maine that is under uh, 600 feet in elevation. 
uh, above sea level, uh, which made it a prime uh, transportation route that uh, the uh, earliest days of and settlement here. Uh, people would take the Hudson River from the Atlantic Ocean, take the Mohawk, uh, and then through another series of streams, get to the Great Lakes. Um, that was the optimal way, really, to transport things between the east and the western part of the United States for a while. Um, but it was inefficient for a while. Uh, so, in 1817, they, struck, they began construction on the Erie Canal, 363 mile uh, long canal from Albany to Buffalo. Uh, and that is uh, really what transformed New York into the entire state, uh, as we like to call it. Uh, cities like Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Utica, Albany, and of course, New York City, which is end of the year now, uh, really flourished as a result of that. Um, and here in Chittenango, we also uh, benefited greatly from the Erie Canal. Uh, we had another canal that went right off it into downtown Chittenango. And uh, where we are now, there were store, there were factories. Uh, we're on the site actually of a ruined cannery uh, building. Um, so the canal and the canal corridor that it follows um, is the optimal route of transportation really in New York. Uh, I-90 currently follows it and uh, once railroads came around, the railroads also pretty much parallel the canal. Um, so the, the second half of the question was um, have any uh, less used forms of transportation continued? to persevere in our area, and yes, the canal has. Uh, New York has invested a ton of money into its canalways, and um, still has and traffic on the barge to move the nine feet. Uh, and since then, with the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway, there's been a little less traffic on it. Um, but still pretty, pretty busy uh, at the moment, and the brewing company shipped all their tanks, which were too large for uh, the highway down it this year. And uh, also, uh, in the future, uh, we have been approved as one of these seven test sites for uh, drone testing. So that is a future way that the Erie Canal corridor is going to be uh, uniquely uh, affected by transportation. All right. Over to you, Carl. Um, so, hi guys, um, I'm Carly Emble, I'm the director of the Baker Heritage Museum in Baker City, Oregon. Um, we're located in Eastern Oregon, so two hours, we're actually two hours west of Boise, um, and we're actually situated right on the Oregon Trail. Our museum is a that used to have we also have the 18 ton cross and fossil collection um, that at one point was actually the Smithsonian for five months. So we have an interesting combination of Oregon Trail history as well as um, rock fossil and stuff. Um, Baker County is a very rural area. We have many members of our community that are still on still ranching communities with still ranching family land that has been in like they've been ranching it for over 100 years. Um, so the history of that goes really far back. Um, and while we are really rural, we still see about 10,000 visitors to the museum every year. So um, to bring it back to the question, what type of unique transportation byways exist in your community? Uh, so I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on the Oregon Trail. Um, we are literally situated on it. You can walk up and you can see the rest that those wagons have left in the ground. Um, so you get a really good sense of the history and how long this area has been a transportation byway. Um, the Oregon Trail, yes, is a huge part of our history, um, but it's a big part of how our area, like the city of Baker City, was actually developed and expanded. Um, 
once basically what would happen is that the white immigrants would come through, some people would stop, but a majority of our family fathers ended up going all the way to the end of the trail, realizing that there was gold here in Baker County, and then they would turn right back around, pretty much always on the same trail that they used to get there. Um, so once they got back here, this is going to be a very affluent area, and you can actually see the remnants of wagon trains in the way that the town was developed. So if you go down our main street, the streets are actually wide enough so that you can turn an entire wagon train around. You can still see the impact today. Um, we still use a lot of the older forms of transportation, like the wagons and horses, um, primarily in ranching, but then also for tourism. So we have play rides and carriage rides that are connected to the area and kind of bolster our tourism. Um, so to bring it back to bring it closer to modern day, um, there are more movement experience like up Highway 84, which goes right by the Um That highway is our way. It, it's the main way that we can get in and out of town, and at times it's the only way that we can really get in and out of River City and to access the other areas in, our, in, in the county. Okay, that, that is my answer to the question. Okay, Okay. Now on to question two. Derek, really. would you like to ask question two? Sure, why not? Uh, okay. Uh, question two was, um, what types of transportation challenges has your community faced or still faces, and how have these been addressed or are being currently managed? Uh, so, um, We've faced a lot of challenges here. Uh, like I said, uh, there was the Mohawk River uh, corridor that took us from the Hudson to the Great Lakes. Uh, that was the initial transportation challenge in this region. Um, that was overcome. Uh, well, so the Mohawk River is an incredibly powerful and unpredictable river. Uh, so you can't really go up and down stream, particularly easy, and then there's also a bunch of uh, waterfalls in it. Uh, so the way we overcame that uh, was by building the Erie Canal, uh, which didn't use any of the natural waterways. It's a 363 mile long uh, artificial river. However, uh, that then presented a challenge. Um, for one, uh, in 1817, we started building the canal. There were no trained uh, engineers, civil engineers, in the United States of America, uh, which is sort of difficult when you're trying to uh, build the most impressive canal on Europe. Uh, but we overcame that. Um, people like Benjamin Wright, Nathan Roberts, Candace White, uh, these local uh, lawyers, teachers, uh, they went to England to study their canals. They read every bit of canal literature they could, and they just, you know, came up with their own things. Uh, so that was pretty good. And they uh, invented things like uh, the incredible five staircase lock in Lockport, uh, the Skagheri River crossing Aqueduct, um, and. Then Canvas White, another major challenge they were facing was that cement had not been produced, hydraulic cement had not been produced in America yet. That was essential to building the canal. And legend has it that in Chittenango, New York, he discovered the limestone that was necessary uh, to make hydraulic cement. And so our little town, you know, is pretty much the reason why New York State could Really, but, well, um, but anyway, uh, so that was we overcame that and uh, it worked well. Uh, and once the canal sort of fell out of its use, I think it was the 1900s, the state probably have faced a sense of pollution. It was actually a challenge then as well. Uh, people we have a large ditch laying around, people tend to throw their garbage in it and waste of other sorts as well. Uh, so that was a major problem here. Um, most people in the area today don't trust our water a lot of the time in the canal. Uh, but since the EPA uh, was founded as the Clean Water Act in the 1970s, uh, 
um, the canal has really improved, uh, but we're still working on it. And uh, currently what we're doing is we're trying to improve people's perception of that water and make it a better uh, recreational waterway. Uh, we're having a series of water tests. And we also have our last year we launched this thing at the museum called the Boat Float, where people uh, from the area that get in the water and uh, kayak down to the museum. And uh, last year we had 101 boats for our first time, which was awesome. Um, so there you go. Okay, I forgot to ask and then what types of transportation challenges have to our community based or still faces. Um, it's really interesting in that a lot of the issues that travelers on the Oregon Trail are facing are similar issues that we are facing today. Um, rain and wet impact on animals and and we don't have any um, and they're having the same things that they were having to deal with. Um, so, like I said before, um, we have Highway 84, um, and I know how, um, I apologize for it, right? Um, I know how before I mentioned that we were a really rural area, um, but when I say rural, like we are two hours and a time change from the closest airport and 45 minutes from the closest Walmart. Um, so being able to take that highway is vital for us to be able to oftentimes get basic necessities. Um, so when those highways shut down, it can be really difficult. So in the winter, sometimes it can get really bad here. And Torrance is not as bad as Syracuse. <laughs> um, we, because <laughs> the population density is very much and it's such a wide expanse of highway, um, they, we just don't have the infrastructure to handle it. Um, so they'll just completely shut the highway down. And sometimes uh, we won't be able to get our groceries delivered. Um, it's difficult for emergency services to get through. Uh, the closest, like, actually high quality hospital with all the amenities that you would need is in Boise. Um, so most of the time, you have a serious car accident, um, we'll actually get life lighted um, So having that highway not be functional has a really significant impact on the area. Um, and to also put it in perspective, last winter there was a 100 mile expanse um, on the highway between where I live and then like the next larger city. Um, and that 100 mile stretch of the highway was only functional and open one third of the winter. Uh, so it's a big deal for our us. Um, so recently they started salting the road, um, which is a normal thing to do in places like upstate New York and other parts of the country. Uh, but for us it's a big deal, especially because so many of uh, our community members are ranchers. There's concerns on the impact of the runoff of um, that salt into their waterways and you know, impacting cattle as well as uh, so that's a new for us that we're starting to deal with, and we're not quite really sure what the ultimate impact is going to be, but it's something we're still wrestling with. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. The, the highway is our life, is our lifeline. Uh, it's down, it has a huge impact on the area. Great. All right, awesome to hear. So, uh, just to repeat the question one more time, is what types of transportation? challenges has your community faced or still faces? And I guess down here, just like everywhere else, the big transportation challenge is just transportation in itself. You know, trying to move something from one place to the other, whether it be goods or people. Um, it seems like since the beginning of time, people have been trying to get uh, things through the valley or even down here to the valley. And I say the valley is in our area where we live, um, the Rio Grande Valley. So. Um, you know, the first people who really lived here, they got around on foot. It wasn't until the Spanish uh, colon colonizers and European explorers came over that they brought the Spanish barb. Uh, that's the type of horse that they brought down here. So if you can think about that, that opened up a whole new world and a whole new way to get around. Um, that also really added to our culture in today's day and time. Uh, this has led to the development of cattle ranching. Um, especially we, the working horseback, uh, the working cowboy, the vaquero, as we call them down here. Um, that tradition really fused together 
um, and created a tradition that's uh, prevalent here in South Texas, but also the entirety of the state, all of Texas, um, including all the way up into Kansas, Montana, the Dakotas. A lot of these cattle drives um, began down here in this area and stretched all the way up north. Um, another big challenge was, well, since we're so close to the ocean as well, uh, where we are in Edinburgh, we're about 70 miles away from the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and our closest port is in Brownsville. Um, in 1852, a lighthouse was built at Port Isabel, which is right off the sea, and uh, it's still standing today. It's actually a, not a state park. It's a state park area. It has a little museum attached as well. But this would really help guide the boats and the ships through here when they were going through the old Brazos Santiago Pass. This was a natural pass that would come through and through the bay, and the uh, goods could be unloaded or taken out into different markets. Um, also, the, something that's kind of unique down here is we had steamboats on our river. The Rio Grande River is not only a natural boat border, but um, it was a way to get around for a good amount of time. Uh, steamboats have a low, a very uh, shallow hull, so they can be in shallow waters, and uh, there were a lot of steamboat ports up and down the Rio Grande Valley. One of our cities in the valley, Brownsville, Texas, uh, they call themselves the New Orleans of South Texas, of the valley, because of all the steamboat culture, there was a lot of uh, Spanish architecture, and they have a party or a big festival called uh, Chadro Days, which they liken to Mardi Gras in, in a sort of way. It's a big show of culture, a lot of uh, parades. So that challenge uh, of how to get things around with steamboats turned into something that um, really stayed in our culture here today. Um, and I guess something else, just something else, kind of really unique. Um, when Zachary Taylor, I'll mention him again, President Zach Taylor, when he was down here as a general, uh, they wanted to solve the problem of how to move cotton from place to place. Uh, there was a port on the south side of the river in Mexico at the time called Baghdad. Uh, this city has long been uh, taken out by a hurricane, but now it's a very nice beach. Um, and Zach Taylor brought camels to Texas from Africa to try and transport cotton bales from place to place. The camels got on all right for a little bit, but eventually their, the pads of their feet were too weak to really, uh, to really like, be pack animals here. So there are still stories of people seeing camels in West Texas in different areas, which could be true or could be tall tales by now. Thank you. Um, so, I guess I can start a question for you if you want to jump into that one. <laughs> sure. Um, so, how are the solar transportation networks continuing to help grow and sustain your community? Uh, so, beyond just ranching in our community, tourism is a huge part of the second driver for me personally. Uh, people come here through that highway that I was talking about. Um, but a lot of the times they're using it, they're, they're coming through because of how beautiful the scenery and the backdrop of the area is. Um, so we've been able to capitalize actually on that and the use of our transportation byways to help continue to fuel tourism to the area. Um, and that's through marketing, honestly. Um, we have the Elk Canyon Scenic Byway. Um, we also are currently working on a Century Farms tour. So there are a lot of farms in this area that get that have been ranched for over a hundred years um, and we get a lot of people that are not from Eastern Oregon and might be from cities like Portland or Seattle or Boise that want to come through and feel this authentic, like have this authentic experience of feeling and seeing what it's like to be in the old wild west. Um, so we put together pamphlets and marketing materials and it's just to encourage people to further experience the area, um, be closer where the food is coming from. Um, so adding an average tourism in there as well. Um, but those that driving is a part of why people come here. Um, we also get a lot of our tourism just by people just stumbling upon Baker County. Um, like I said before, Boise is the closest New York City, but if you're gonna drive from Boise to Portland, Oregon, we're the main highway you have to go through to get there. So a lot of the time people stop in Baker City to get gas or lunch and they stumble on this picturesque historic town. Um, and people will come through, they'll see the area, they see how beautiful it is, and a lot of the times they'll either extend their trip so that they can stay here, or they will make sure that they come back 
to send this out faster or to send us directly related being so close to that major highway. Um, also going back to ranching, we can't talk about Oregon without talking about ranching a lot. <laughs> um, Baker County is still one of the cities in the country that you can do your cattle drive on the actual road um, We still don't get a lot of traffic, so you can take your horses and you instead of instead of putting your cattle on a truck and having to pay for all of that, you can just get on your horse, unseat your cattle, and then get it ready to go. Um, so having all of this tourism has also been controversial in the community. Um, as much as people here really want the economic impact of these tourist principal coming through um, on the off the road, uh, it, it's changing the culture here. Um, as I said before, we're having so many old mission families. Um, a lot of the times they like the way that old is. They enjoy that we're a small town that like you can see the, the mountain ranges, there's not a lot of big buildings. Um, we don't have a lot of city slickers here. Um, but because of the increased tourism, um, and then there are a lot of people that are relocating here from Seattle and from Portland. Um, we have a thriving artist community, we have a thriving musical community. Um, it, it, it's changing things. Um, but because we're so isolated, it's changing it really in a really small manner. And at the same time, it's still encouraging our community to support local and not necessarily go outside of the town and have care for supplies or other things that you might use Amazon Prime. Um, so these historic transportation networks are in a lot of ways fueling all these tourism and community and cultural changes here, which is really interesting to watch. Cool. Uh, I guess I'll go ahead and go next. And I can kind of segue off that because that's something that's similar down here in the valley is that uh, a lot of the historic transportation networks have changed uh, everything really. I guess if we're looking at the industry of our region, over time, it started with ranching. It really boomed with agriculture. Um, we're way south from, from both of y'all's sites. Uh, so we do have about three or four growing seasons within the year. So it's a farmer's dream down here. We get freezes maybe every couple decades. Uh, but after agriculture, it changed to industry. Um, from there, even to today, we have almost like a service ecotourism uh, industry here. And uh, transportation has done a lot to change that. Something that's really cool, um, I mentioned the lighthouse before. That lighthouse is, like I said, a state park. It was restored and opened to the public in 1952. I know I think they just they just reopened it also, so you actually get up on the landing at the very top, a really nice view. And uh, it's in the National Register of Historic Places. That was back in 1976 that they added that. So that historic tourism um, really helps drive the community down here. Port Isabel is a small community. Right now it's you know spring break, so we have a lot of uh, college kids down there, um, but that history uh, really helps bring people in throughout the rest of the year. Um, another really cool thing that, what I like seeing as well is, I like seeing historic buildings being reused uh, in today's day and age. We have a couple of really awesome railroad depots in the towns. Uh, the one here in Edinburgh, Texas is currently our Chamber of Commerce. Um, but it really, the railroad opened up a whole lot of markets to the rest of the country, to the rest of international markets as well. As I said, with all our agriculture, we had to get those fruits and vegetables. We had to find a way to send them to New York or to Oregon or to wherever uh, they might, might be needed. So um, in 1927, the Southern Pacific Depot opened up in Edinburgh, Texas. This was a really big deal. Um, this really grew the population. Uh, this was about the turn of the century, you know, 1920, 1930. Uh, people started coming here to work because there was work and um, what was once, you know, maybe a, a $4 orange became a $6 orange uh, somewhere up north. Um, and yeah, those historic railways, there's still a way to get around. Uh, something that I like as well is riding my bike around town. Um, in Brownsville, they restored one of the old railroad tracks and they paved it over completely and it's a byway where you can go on bicycles directly from an old battle site to downtown Brownsville. Um, it's gotten the community fit as well as having fun, getting them outside. Most of the year our temperature is pretty agreeable. It's just a couple summer months where it's very, very hot. But other than that, it's really nice to get outside uh, as long as you don't have a big shower. Um, 
or you know a big storm come through. It's very nice. Uh, we're in a sub in a sub uh, tropical area, so we have a lot of birds coming through. And like I said, the ecotourism has uh, has really grown to be, I guess, today's big focus. Um, and I guess one more story to leave you guys with. I mentioned steamboats earlier, and there's a really cool story that that we like here at the museum. So the last steamboat on the Rio Grande was called Bessie. Uh, she was owned by the Richard King and Mifflin Kennedy uh, Shipping Company. And Richard King, if you ever heard of the King Ranch, was, was the biggest ranch in the world for a little bit. I think it still may be. Um, uh, this uh, the steamboat, I'm sorry, had a bell. Most steamboats had a horn on it, a steam horn, but it had an actual 400 pound bell. Uh, on its final trip, this was in 1902, um, they parked the steamboat up onto the landing and they pretty much stripped it for wood for anything they could salvage. Um, one person had enough foresight to salvage the bell, they used it at a sugarcane plantation for a good amount of time. And now it rings in a church in downtown McAllen at St. Joseph the Worker. Um, in 1975, it was moved there. So that's something from transportation that still rings today, I guess, pun intended. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, all right. So I guess that means my turn. Uh, all right. So. Um, Transportation is still, our historic transportation networks around here are still huge. Um, so our biggest, I think, like many of ours, is uh, obviously uh, tram tourism and recreation. Um, that is really, the canal is huge on that. Um, we, uh, a certain really would done the people level on the canal every year, but that's over 363 miles. Uh, but still, we see it here today um, at the museum. We had visitors from 19 countries this year, 48 states. If you know anybody from Mississippi or uh, North Dakota, send them our way. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, so tourism is huge. Uh, and recently, our community has really started embracing our canal uh, heritage. Buffalo and Rochester, I can go very well, but uh, Syracuse for us, Clinton Square, where there was the uh, canal, uh, they filled in the canal for Syracuse, but in Clinton Square, that is like the center of Syracuse still, and uh, in Baltimore still, there's still a big canal presence there. Uh, people are bars, ice cream shops, and stuff around it. It's really impressive. And here at Chittenango, uh, we're happy that we're going to be connecting the uh, towpath trail, which is a 36 mile long trail along the Old Erie Canal. That's going to connect to a trail into the village of Chittenango. So uh, Renee, when it's 100 and whatever degrees in Texas, <laughs> feel free to ride a bike up here. <laughs> Much cooler. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and we get tons of bike riders here, and uh, in we, the state of New York is invested heavily in what's called the Empire Trail and New York 2020. Uh, by 2020, um, the canal, there will be a trail that runs along the canal all the way from Buffalo to Albany, totally complete. Most of it's built in now. There's just a few sections in a couple of cities that aren't built in, and then from there it'll go up to Canada and down to New York. That'll be the longest trail in uh, in contained in the state. Uh, we're excited for that here. Um, so, um, like I also said, uh, drones are becoming a huge thing in the corridor. They're bringing a ton of jobs here. Specifically, uh, Privis was formerly Air Force Base, now it's Business Park or whatever, and that's in Rome, which is right where they started there. Pretty neat, and um, along the same transportation route, um, we have I-90, which is still the main artery of central New York, and much of New York goes all the way from Boston to Seattle, I believe. So that's pretty, pretty good. Um, yeah. So, and with the with the Clean Water Act, uh, the pollution thing has made this a really vibrant area to 
paddle to do do water sports. So, so there's the canal. Maybe Central New York would have like, right. So now I think we're going to open up the floor to any questions from anyone in the audience, thanks, or or comments. San Fernando Valley, is what it's called. Uh, but here we call it the Rio Grande Valley. We are basically um, at the mouth of the Rio Grande River. If you look at the picture of the United States, right at the very bottom of the tip of Texas, there are four counties that are right there. Um, I guess the big cities that we have here is Brownsville, there's also South Padre Island. Um, but the valley is about 120 miles Rhode Island. from the east to west, Rhode Island. the size of Rhode Island. Uh, but in total, we have a population of about like one, one point two, three million in the whole region. It, it is pretty spread out, though. So it's almost uh, something we say often is if you were to get the valley and squeeze it together, it'd be about the size of San Antonio. Okay. Um, I 
Well, I guess thank you, everybody. Thank you all for joining us in the call. And uh, and howdy to everybody. Hope everybody's having a great weekend. Uh, it's 90, I think it's 94 degrees down here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all so much.